Well, I thought that David invited me here to teach on how to survive marriage. <laughs> Peggy and I get to watch your church sometimes, and for whatever reason, we don't get to go to church out of our Karnak house. So uh, we, we've just felt so excited for you that you have a pastor that teaches through books, verse by verse. I don't know how blessed you are to have that. I hear so many strange things said in God's name that it's just grateful to have an expository preacher. Thank you, David. I'm so glad my daughter and son-in-law are here to, to experience that. Well, if I, I was thinking to myself as I was praying about what I should uh, preach on today. If I have one time to speak to an American church in this modern era, what, what would I preach on? And I think I've come to the text that I, I would like to share with you. And um, I want to remind you that sermons are a two-way street. Uh, that if you haven't prayed for me before you got here, then don't gripe about nothing. Amen? Because this is not a performance, right? Uh, this is God's people gathering to seek His will for our lives that we can be different in the world outside these walls for next week. And so there needs to be a regular prayer time, not just for the church and society, but for those who lead. I hope you pray for your Sunday school teacher. I hope you pray for your civil leaders. Amen? I mean, we can't gripe about politics if we haven't prayed for anybody. Right? Because as Christians, we are mandated to pray for those in governmental authority, whether you agree with them or not. So I hope you think about our responsibility as far as prayer and how uh, information is disseminated among the church of God and how we respond to it. Now, some of you said, I, I remember you from a few years ago. Boy, that was very encouraging to me. Thank you so much. And you'll remember that I talked about that the Bible needs to be interpreted in light of two principles. Number one, there is only one inspired person in Bible study, and that is the original author. The only ins inspiration comes through them. And secondly, that the way we need to understand the Bible is what could the first hearers have understood? Now, those two pillars are how we must approach the Bible because we're coming from a different culture and a different language. And we've got to be careful that the Bible was written for you, but not to you. This is not the morning newspaper. This is an ancient text. And to understand what it means to me and to you, I must understand what it meant to the person who wrote it and the first group to receive it. So I'm going to be dealing with Ephesians chapter 4. I think the book of Ephesians is probably my favorite book in the whole New Testament. And I think it has at least five messages for the modern church. I'm going to do, do one of them so your chicken is safe. It won't be burnt. Uh, but I want to do a, a brief historical setting because studying the Bible is like listening to half a phone conversation. And how often I've tried to do that and I've totally misunderstood what was being said even though I understood the words that were being said. I just didn't catch the context. So how do I get the context of a Bible passage. Well, the other side of the, of the phone conversation is the historical setting of the original author. The who, what, when, where, and why that they wrote. And the second part is how do they present their message, the literary context. And that's why it's so crucial to study the Bible completely through a book because every book has one central message and as we follow the author through the book, the author sets the guidelines on how to understand that subject. And what we're terribly guilty of is treating the Bible like isolated truths, propositional statements. And part of that comes from King James indenting every verse. As you know, indentation, capitalization, uh, punctuation, uh, chapter divisions, none of that is inspired. All of that didn't occur until England <laughs> in the 1600s, 1700s. So none of that's inspired. So we've got to go back and ask ourselves, who is this person writing to and why? 
Now, most of Paul's books break into two halves. We call them occasional documents because they're written for a problem in the church. And so Paul is going to address that problem with theology, and then he's going to apply that theology in the second half of the book. Now, Ephesians works perfectly like that. Chapters 1 through 3 are theological, and 4 through 6 are practical. So just real quick, make you think. The background to this is a group of false teachers that came to a church that Paul didn't start. And Epiphras came to tell him about it. And Paul wrote a book to these false teachers that you know as the book of Colossians. Sometime after that, Paul in prison had plenty of time. He knew this heresy was going to spread. And he wrote a cyclical book. Now, have you ever noticed there's no hellos and goodbyes in, in the book of Ephesians? And matter of fact, if you have your Bibles open and you'll look at chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, in Ephesus, the margin of your study Bible was going to say, not in the oldest and best Greek manuscripts, which means there was a blank there. And this book followed the postal route that you know as the seven letters to the churches in Revelation, the same Roman postal route to the same western part of Turkey. So this is a cyclical letter. And this is why the church is universal in Ephesians and local in Colossians based on exactly the same outline. Now this heresy is, I need to talk quickly about it so you'll understand what chapter 4 is about. Uh, we call this by the Greek word for knowledge, gnosis. So these are Gnostics. And these are people who overemphasize the human aspect of salvation. Uh, they would say they had secret knowledge from Jesus and that Jesus really wasn't fully God and fully man. He was God, but he wasn't really a man. And they would say the way to be saved is not Jesus dying on the cross and you trusting him by faith. They would say it's secret knowledge that they got from Jesus himself. And if you join their group, they would give you this elite knowledge so you could pass through the angelic realm uh, in your way to the high God. Now, see, that's shocking to us because what we do as modern readers, we pick up this book, we read a verse here, a verse there, and think we've understood it. But if I found an old... <laughs> this is going to get you, so just be prepared. Let's say I found a love letter you wrote during high school on Valentine's Day to somebody in your seventh grade class. And it was five pages of ooey gooey I love you forever stuff you know those letters you wrote and I found that letter in the attic 20 years later and because I'm your loving brother I brought it downstairs to you <laughs> and read two sentences off the third page how badly could I embarrass you reading two sentences and you would say to me Bob you've got to know when I wrote that who I wrote that to why I wrote that, and Bob, you've got to read the whole letter. Do you hear God screaming that at us? Because we, teach, we interpret the Bible by taking little phrases out of it, putting English definitions on it, totally ignoring the original context, and beating our brothers and sisters over the head with it. Not you, but the Baptists in California. <laughs> so... The first three, now just think quickly with me. I'm going to do this quickly. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians deal with theology that human beings have nothing to do with to confront this overemphasis on human knowledge. Now, friends, not too long ago, there was a movie called The Da Vinci Code, right? Remember that? That's based on this false theology coming from a non-canonical book called The Gospel of Thomas. Jesus was married, had a child. This child is special. See, that's Gnostic, all Gnostic. And what scared me is the church had no clue about that movie because they don't study the Bible for themselves. Chapter 1 is John Calvin's favorite chapter, predestination. Chapter 1 of Ephesians, chapter 9 of Romans, the two most definitive chapters on predestination in the Bible. So Paul starts out with, God's sovereignty is the answer to these false teachings. Secondly, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, one sentence in Greek, is the definitive passage on the unmerited grace of God in the whole New Testament. 
Human beings have nothing to do with that. Beginning in chapter 2, verse 11, through chapter 3, verse 13, is the chapter on the mystery of God, hidden from the ages, but now revealed in Jesus Christ, that Jew and Gentile are now one in Christ. No more male, no more female, no more Jew, no more Greek, no more slave, no more free. All one in Christ, and that has always been God's plan, but it's now revealed in the life and ministry of Christ. You see how those three doctrinal sections deal with the heresy that Paul is writing to? Now, coming in chapter 4 is where the practical section begins. So based on the turmoil in the church, based on the turmoil in thinking about what God really wants his people to know and do, Paul begins to write the practical section. Just think of this. Chapter 4, the one I'm going to deal with, really talks about the unity of the people of God. Chapter 5, this is the be filled with the Spirit text. Chapter 6 is spiritual warfare. Do you see what Paul is doing? He's preparing a church to understand the kind of day in which they live and how to appropriately react to it. Now, I've always thought it's really interesting that the first two verses of Ephesians 4, I think, are the criteria of how we ought to treat one another. Now, I want to say this as I'm screaming now. Peggy always asks me when I come home if she's not with me, did you scream today? Yes, I did. <laughs> how we treat each other. If I could put it in terms of 1 John, don't tell me you, you love God and hate your brother or you're a liar. We tell God how much we love him by how we treat one another. You do know that, right? That how we treat one another is God's will for his people to show the world what real love is. We are an oasis in a desert of unbelief. And if the oasis isn't functioning well, what must the world think? So these criteria here basically are how we ought to treat one another. And I want to make this, this other point as clearly as I can. This must be individual. This is not leadership. This is every individual Christian must intently, personally, daily apply these, these two verses to their lives. No one can do this for you. This is not the revival time. This is not the special time. This is the way God's people are to treat each other all the time. But it's got to be a personal, intentional decision to do this. This is exactly opposite of the what's in it for me of the fall. One way you know that you've been saved is used to, you used to think about what I want, what I need, what I like. And suddenly we start thinking about how can I be a blessing to others? What do others need? How can I serve? See, total change from the world to the kingdom. And this is going to talk about this. So let me do this. I try to do this humorously sometimes because I can hit you with a bigger hammer. So please laugh at my jokes if you would. I'll feel so much better. Now, he's, he mentioned in verse 1 that, that he, is, he is in prison. And uh, he has this, we want to walk worthy of the calling which where we have. Now, the word walk in the Bible is always, unless it says Jesus walked from Jericho to Jerusalem, that's literal. But most of the other time, walk is biblical imagery for the Christian life. Now, just look real quickly through here. We're to walk worthy of the calling. Look down in verse 15. Walking love, just as Christ loved you. Uh, look over at verse uh, 17. Uh, walk, no longer walk as the Gentiles walk. Uh, this is the practical section. We're talking about the Christian life. And we need to walk worthy of the calling. Now, you probably don't realize it, but the little prayer at the end of chapter 3, what a beautiful little prayer. Paul just, I think Paul liked his own preaching and quite often he broke out in praise right in the middle of his sermons because he got so overcome by the truth the Spirit was giving him. So this little closing prayer of the doctrinal section, I just love this, so i got to touch it real quick. Unto him who is able. Isn't that a wonderful name for God? Would you look in the margin of your study Bible? That is used three times in the New Testament for, for God, and every one of them says a different thing. Every one of them has a different To God who is able to, three different things. That's a good homework for tonight. Look up those three different things and rejoice in the person of God and what he's doing for you. Now, the word church is a play on the word call. Church is just a preposition, ek, and the normal Greek word for calling. 
So he's playing on the word called. The church is the called out ones. Now, because we are part of the people of God, we are called to walk worthy. And how? By the calling which we have from God. So the word called is really functioning in many different ways through here. Same word, but in context, it's used in different ways. Now, number two begins the list of things that Paul says each and every individual Christian much intentionally, daily, prayerfully <laughs> commit to do among one another. This church is disrupted by false teachers. This church is disrupted by terrible, terrible conflict in the church. So Paul says, how do you solve it? You, you don't solve it by, by everybody agreeing. You solve it by everybody loving one another. It's quite a different model, isn't it? Let's look at this list. In humility, and I want you to know, humility is a uniquely Christian virtue. Uh, Paul's list of, uh, of vices and virtues is almost the same as the Greek philosophers called the Stoics of the first century. They were very moral Greek philosophers. They weren't saved, but they, they, they had a moral part to their, their philosophy. They never mentioned humility. Greek world saw humility as weakness, as milk toastness, as passiveness. But do you know there are only two people called humble in the Bible? Moses, numbers five, I think, where it says Moses was the most humble man that ever lived. By the way, for those of you who are theologians, that does show that there's an editor in the Pentateuch because Moses can't write, I'm the most humble man that ever lived. <laughs> you blow it right there, you know. So had to be an editor, probably a priest or a Levite that recorded Moses and added his own comment there. The other one is Jesus, Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you, lean on me, for I am meek and lowly at heart. There's that word humility. So if humility is good enough for Moses and Jesus, it probably ought to be humility for us. Amen. Let me just be real rude and crude and say what humility really means is you ain't that hot sucker. It's not up to you to tear everything up over your personal preferences, over your opinions. Humility is needed because we have different gifts. And the gifts function in different ways. And we cannot be competitive amongst one another. Humility is a purposeful act. The second one. I remember I was preaching in Brazil. We had a young Brazilian that translated for me a lot and came to live with Peggy and I and go to school. So I'm trying to illustrate what this word means, gentleness. Well, it means domesticated strength. So I, <laughs> I was trying to use the Lone Ranger, and she said, they don't know who the Lone Ranger is. I said, Jusalee, just translate. You don't have to comment in the middle of the sermon. So the Lone Ranger, and some, if you've watched Nick at Night, you know who the Lone Ranger is. Yes, I'm looking at you young people. Yeah, it's this guy with a big, beautiful white horse, right? And he wears a mask, right? Now, that horse is really big, and that rider is really little. How does that little rider control that massive horse? That horse has been domesticated. Now, you don't want to break the spirit of that horse, but you want the power and spirit of that horse to be directed toward the will of the rider. <laughs> David, I was preaching in West Texas on this, and I was trying to impress people. I must admit I was. So I said, there's this 2,000-pound horse and a 150-pound man. And this farmer came up to me and said, I learned something new today. Well, that's going, yeah, what? He said, I didn't know that the Lone Ranger rode a Clydesdale. Well, I don't know how big the stupid horse is. It's a big horse, big horse. <laughs> Whatever it weighs, it's bigger than the Lone Ranger. So this means domesticated strength. Now, take that into your life. And I'm going to hit this as my second major point. You have been gifted by God to serve the people of God. You've not been gifted by God to show off. It's not a merit badge. It's a servant's towel. And so what we must do is recognize that I, myself, me, I am gifted and I have a crucial place, not subordinate, I have a crucial place in the life of the church. And your strengths and weaknesses, if you believe the Bible, Psalm 139 said that God made all of us emotionally and physically the way he wanted to. 
So we don't need to be praying to be different. We need to recognize that God needs our strengths and we need to use them for him. The third one here is uh, patience. And this is always, I love this one. This, this word usually means patience with people. So here's my little joke. If nobody in this church gets on your nerves, you don't go here. <laughs> Amen? Now, there are people that I would be friends with if I met them in Walmart or the local bar. I mean, our personalities would just, doink, be, we'd be friends. But that's not always true in the church. But the truth is, I'm commanded to love you, respect you, and to be humble around you because we've both been bought with the blood of Jesus. We are the family of God, and I need to be patient with you. Surely there's nothing in my life that would make somebody impatient with me. I'm after you, sucker, and you're just sitting there looking at me. Every one of, everybody marries somebody strange. So if we can be patient with our wives and our children, don't you know we ought to be patient with our fellow brother and sister covenant people? You say, well, they don't act right. So you act right all the time? You never get in the flesh? You never say the wrong thing? You never get pouty? We need a spiritual mirror. James 5, by the way, is that spiritual mirror. So we got to be patient with one another, even weird ones. <laughs> Show forbearance to one another. Now, this word forbearance is from the theatrical realm. You know, in, in the theater, there's a kind of a spotlight on center stage, and different actors would move to that place to give their lines. This word means you don't always have to be in the center spotlight. It's okay for others to lead. It's okay for others to take their example, uh, their suggestion, uh, their willingness to have. We've, we've got to see ourselves as a family, and we've got to function as a family. My little example is nobody wants to be an appendix. But I guarantee you this. If your appendix is bad, you're going to die soon. Amen? So appendix are absolutely crucial for the health and growth of the body of Christ. And all of us are gifted. All of us have a unique place that no one else can fulfill but us. You were placed here by God to be a part of a complete family. And it, what we've done to the church is we've turned it into platform and non-platform and we've turned it into one hour a week in some building somewhere. I assure you that is not the church of the New Testament. Forbearance to one another. Now, notice where we're breaking down that. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. I like the way the New English Bible says this. Spare no effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now that means that unity in the church of Jesus Christ cannot be the responsibility of leadership. Unity in the church of Jesus Christ is the responsibility of every born-again person, a member of that body. And how do we do that? Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearing one another. That's how we do it. We don't get to vote on whether you like everybody or like... We, don't get, we get to love. We get to die to self and love one another because that's how the world knows we're his disciple. Amen? Love is the only non-counterfeitable thing in this world. Everything else, Satan is counterfeited. But how we love one another is a sign to the world something is different here. There, there's, there's joy here. There's peace here. There's contentment here. There's differentness here. And the way we live our lives is that beacon. And the way we treat one another is the model the world desperately needs. Now, I wish I had time to go into this unity text. We often say in theology that these verses 4 through about 6 is the unity text. And just to put it back real quickly this way. We are to be one, the body of Christ, because God and the Father and the Spirit are one. Okay? The unity of the Trinity is to be reflected in the unity of God's people. Now, we have done a lot of wonderful things in the church. We've, done, we've started schools. Uh, we, we've done all kind of wonderful things. But I want to say this. 
We have miserably failed at being one. Every, as I drove in, every corner has a different name, supposedly of the same people of God. And they won't let you join each other's group either. And their group is closer to God than your group. You do know that, right? There are 1,500 denominations with Baptists in the title that will not accept one another as members. Holy spit, what has happened to us? The text that grabs me the most is Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. Where three times he says to the Father, Father, I pray that they be one even as we are one. Three times Jesus prayed that prayer for his church. I think that ought to be the prayer that we have. Because as we love one another, even though we're different, even though we may rub each other wrong, even though we may not disagree on everything, when the world sees us patience, loving, and kind to one another, it says something to them that nothing else can say. Now let me move through this oneness text, though, and, and come down to verses, um, verse 8. Well, I, I can go back to verse 7 with this. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, if you have your reference Bible, and I hope you do, in verse 8, you will see it's a quote here from the Old Testament. It's a psalm. If you go back and read this psalm in the Old Testament, it doesn't say what this says. Hmm. Matter of fact, this is not a quote from the Hebrew text. It's not a quote from the Greek text, the Septuagint. This is a quote from one Aramaic Targum. Now, the reason I'm saying this to you is the Old Testament says that men give gifts to God. The Septuagint says men give gifts to God. This one Aramaic Targum that Paul chose to use says that God gives gifts to men. Total reversal of the Hebrew and Greek text. Now, what Paul wants to say is, each of us are gifted. And I tell you, the text, it just, oh, it just it vibrates through my whole being. I think the definitive text on spiritual gifts is 1 Corinthians 12. And the two verses that grab me more and more is 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 12, 11. Now, what, it, what those two verses say is that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to each of us. And I would add, I think those gifts come at salvation. So if you're old enough to be saved, you are old enough to be gifted. And secondly, that we are gifted, this is the kicker, for the common good. Mature Christianity understands that the goal of the Christian life is the health and growth of the body. But see, we are Western individualists. And our Western individualism has skewed the message of the corporate Eastern New Testament. They are family-oriented. We are individual-oriented. But I say to you, when you become a Christian, you become part of a family. And you no longer live for yourself, but you live for the body. Oh, what a message we need in the church of Jesus Christ today. It's not all about you. But it is all about him. It's not all about personal preference. But it is about kingdom goals. Notice if you would then. Verses uh, 9 and 10 have always been uh, somewhat interesting to me. I wish I knew exactly what this is. The, the question here is where, where, what is the descent and ascent? Um, there's two views. One is when Jesus left heaven and was incarnated into the womb of Mary in, uh, in Nazareth and then born in Bethlehem. When, that is when he left heaven and that's when he came to earth. The other possible view is that when he died on the cross, I'm talking about 1 Peter 3 here, and he descended into Hades and preached to the spirits in prison. That was also ascent and descent. One is from heaven to earth, one is from earth to Sheol. So I think this is the incarnation. I think we're talking about Jesus left heaven and was willing to become one of us to show us, number one, how significant God thinks human beings are. Just quickly, I want to chase this rabbit. I want to remind you that you are a higher spiritual order than angels. 
There is no angel ever said to be created in the image and likeness of God. There is, Jesus did not die for angels. Now I know that Psalms 8, quoted in, the, in, in Hebrews, says, you were made a little lower than the angels. Friends, I hope you'll look at that text again. The word there is Elohim, which is exactly the word for God in Genesis 1.1. We weren't made a little lower than the angels. We were made a little lower than God. We share his very nature. Holy moly, what a revelation. But right now we live in a glass darkly. Right now we don't know who you are. I heard of somebody one time say that good preaching is telling Christians what they already are in Christ. I like that. Because I don't think we know who we are. You are an awesome spiritual creature. You have been gifted by God for a particular time and a particular place. You were created to be gifted and blessed. To the body. There are no throwaway Christians. There are no lesser Christians. Once we see that. It changes the way we view the dynamic. Of working with one another. Now beginning in verse. My last major point. Is in verse 11 and 12. And I usually say this. And I want to say it here. If I have misinterpreted this. God protect you from me. But if I have interpreted this accurately, I'm praying that I can loose the Holy Spirit on you right now. That you can't leave this building the same as you came in. And you've got to decide if I'm saying the truth or just saying what I want to say. Because this truth will change your life. And that's exactly what the Bible wants to do. Now verse 11 is a list of the different leadership gifts in the early church. Now look at this list. And I say to myself, well I, I think I know what Suddenly, I begin to look and look, and I don't know what these people are. This, this saying, there, there's an ongoing gift of apostleship. I don't know what an apostle is. Is it someone who has an influence over a lot of churches or somebody on the mission field that starts a lot? I don't know what an apostle is. But they've been given, and they continue to be given. And what is a prophet? I mean, is that, is that an Old Testament prophet that writes Scripture? Or is that a New Testament prophet? That interprets scripture for the, for the church. I think it's a New Testament prophet. And what about an evangelist? Now we don't, we don't do evangelism stuff much anymore. We used to. It was a big deal. Every year you had a, a, a one or two revivals. I would hate to have to live on the salary of an evangelist today in Baptist life. It's almost a forgotten gift. But I'm not sure if that's a, meant to be a gift in the local church or an itinerant gift. Those of you who are older, you'll know this. Somebody said, what is an evangelist? Well, I know it's someone who has white shoes, a white belt, screams a lot, and brings their own offering envelopes. <laughs> Y'all have been in those meetings, haven't you? Oh, those guys are wild. Um, we desperately need this gift today, but I'm not sure if it's local or itinerant. And what about pastor-teacher? The Greek text here implies this is one, one, one office here because this is a church disrupted by this heresy and so the teacher, pastor needs to be a teacher too. So one gift, pastor-teacher. What are these meant to do? Now, I want you to look at verse 12 with me for a minute. And I want to say it this way. I, I pastored a long time before I became a professor Matter of fact, Peggy and I's first church was close to Marshall, uh, Nesbitt Baptist Church, if y'all know Marshall. When Peggy and I got there, <laughs> Peggy played the piano, I led the singing, I preached the sermon, I locked the doors, and I swept the place. If I got sick, the church closed, man. One person doing everything. Statistics say in the modern Baptist church, 5 to 10% of the people do 80 to 90% of all the work in ministry. Think what I just said. So we got a few people trying to do everything and robbing other Christians of their spiritually given task. And what you do when you have four or five things to do in leadership, you burn yourself out and your marriage falls apart. And the same thing happens to pastors. We are... There are more pastors quitting, particularly during this uh, pandemic time, than are being trained in seminaries to replace them. It's overwhelming percent are just leaving. 
And I think it's because that churches put too many hats on them. I remember people would call me and say, Brother Bob, um, my second cousin is in the hospital 50 miles away. Would you go pray with them? You can't pray for your own cousin. The pastor's got to go to show it's real. I got to drive 50 miles because you can't pray for your own cousin? Or they would call me and say, uh, Brother Bob, my child is ready to trust Christ. Would you come by and lead them to Christ? You, you can't lead your own children to Christ? You think I got a little stamp that I put on their butt that says this pastor was here when I get through witnessing to him? I've had people tell me, if the pastor doesn't come to my home once a year, the church doesn't care. You need to grow up, you selfish Western Christian. It's not all about you. We are making people in the church do everything, and we're doing nothing but coming one hour to one building and think we're great Christians. I assure you, every Christian is a called, gifted, full-time minister. Now, you may not be a platform person, and you may not be a greeter, but I guarantee you there's a place for you and uniquely for you in the church of Jesus Christ, or the Bible is a lie. And there are no lesser Christians. They're just crucial Christians. But we've so structured the church that we don't do the body life that way anymore. So look at verse 12. God have mercy on me. For the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. Now, who is to do the work of service? Well, if my grammar is not completely wacko, it's meant to be the saints. And so what is the job of the leadership? is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. I think the best analogy for pastor is a player coach. I was in Brazil, preach, I preached the same service in Brazil. And I, I, we had a time where we asked the people to come and tell the leadership what they would like to do, what they felt like God wanted them to do. This good young lady came up to me and said, I, I, I want to be a flag person. I must admit to you, I didn't know what a flag person was. I thought they must be flag football. I didn't know. <laughs> what is a flag person? I said, well, then you ought to pursue it. If you can find a camp that teaches flag ministry, I'll pay for it. You know what it was? It was um, artistic flags during worship service. Totally out of Baptist experience. But they have colored flags and they dance across the stage. And the, This girl wanted to be a flag twirler for Jesus. Amen. I'm going to tell her no. We don't do flag here. Get over it. If I put you in a room and ask you what would you like to do for God and there was no time, education, or money involved, what would you tell me? And I'd come back and say to you, that may be what God wants you to do. Have you ever said the key words in this whole deal is, I am available my friend the only decision you really have in the kingdom is i'm available everything else is up to god amen opening doors gifting you opportunity everything else is up to him but what he wants you to say is dad i'm a little uncomfortable in this but this is what i think you want me to do you Sitting is not one of the gifts. Sunday only is not one of the gifts. So if I've been talking, I hope you prayed for me before I came. If I've been talking, the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you. Now, you're here for a reason. It's not by accident. And you are a called, gifted, spiritual creature for the kingdom of God. And what you do is crucial. It's not optional. It's crucial for the health and growth of the body. What does God want you to do? I think every Christian ought to have some kind of personal ministry. It may focus toward the world. It may focus toward the church. I, I, I think the list of the gifts are, are not, uh, not only, it, they're representative samples. The gifts aren't the same. The, there's four lists, they're not the same. And even the order's not the same when they are the same. 
It's, it's as wide as the world. What do you want to do for God? If you could, what would you want to do? I would just say to you quickly, the little book that's helped me the most in this area, it costs one dollar. It's done by a Campus Crusade speaker named Paul Little. And it's called Affirming the Will of God. This is not Bible. This is Paul Little. And I think he's right. There are five things he says. Number one, have you ever prayed specifically, God, what do you want me to do in the church? Not now I lay me down to sleep, not thank you for the ribs. No, no. God, what do you want me to do in your body? Specific prayer. Number two, talk to mature Christians who know you and ask them, what strengths do you see in my life? I guarantee you, I did not know I was a professor until people started telling me, pastors don't do five word studies. <laughs> they don't do present passive participles. I thought I was, when I surrendered to preach, the only thing they wanted you to cluttering the altar with is surrendering to preach or being a missionary. There was no other options in the church at that time. I think we've come farther than that. And that every one of you, every one of you has a place, significant place of ministry in this body. That's why you're here. Talk to mature Christians who know you. Find someone who's doing what you think you want to do. You want to be an evangelist? Go with an evangelist. You think God's called you to prayer? Find you a prayer warrior and pray with them. You want to be a builder for churches with Texas Baptist men? Go and do a couple of projects with them. If you start finding great joy and peace in your life and others start being blessed, you probably found it. And by the way, I think all of us have only one gift. So us trying to do way too many things clouds the water. We ought to decide what God's in our life and then focus for training and opportunities. Now, the last one's going to surprise you. It surprised me when I read it. Let's say two opportunities open up. Which one do you choose? In the past, I would always think, Oh, I would choose the one that I really don't want to because that's got to be God's will. What kind of weird view of your father is that? If you give him your life, he's going to send you to Madagascar and make you eat hissing roaches. Yes, that's what he's going to. Why would you think that? What kind of view of that is your daddy? God, here's my life. And then the desires of your heart begin. You begin to understand what his desire is for you. So, guess which one you pick? The one you want to. Is that shocking to you? I'm probably gifted in the area I feel gifted in. This desire of me to serve the church is probably God-given. So I need to find opportunities, either in here, during the week, or toward the world. Would you look at me a minute? You are an awesome, wonderful called, gifted minister of the body of Christ. <laughs> every one of you, and some of you are real jerks, but every one of you are a minister. <laughs> every one of you are crucial. Every one of you have a substantial place. Can you receive that from me? Can you receive that from Paul? Can you receive that from that still, small voice speaking in your head right now? If I put you in a room... What would you like to do for God? What would you like to do? Can you have the faith to step out and say, God, if that's what you want, I'm available? God, if you'll just show me, I'll, even though I'm uncomfortable, scared to death. I just real quickly, I want to say to you, when I was called to preach, I ran for 10 years. It terrified me. I stuttered. I was shy. Little churches in East Texas let me come on Wednesday night, preach five minutes or ten minutes, and the ladies would say, oh, Bob, you did so good. Have another tuna fish sandwich. And they got me over the fear of standing up in front of people. I really thought, you're going to laugh at this, I thought, okay, God, I'll surrender to preach, and I'll keep a bottle of vodka in my desk because I know I'll be afraid. I'll drink as much as I have to to get up in front of people. I thought I was going to have to do it that way. God has wonderfully set me free to be a speaker for him. But it didn't come easy, and it didn't come immediately, but it did come with I am available. I'm available, God. 
You say, I, I, I have a dream that's so... You think you've got a dream bigger than God? You think he can't take you who are made in his image and likeness and use you in a way far beyond that you can imagine because you're available and he wants to be a blessing to his people? And he wants to bring lost people to this family? Now, why is it so important that you know that you're a called, gifted, full-time minister? Well, 13 and 14. Until we all, not some, not the elite, not the educated, not the rich, until we all obtain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer children Tossed here and there by every waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which the joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up itself in love. Would you bow your heads, please? Mm -mm. I'm going to ask the pastor and, and the deacons and elders to come forward. I'm going to have to stand right down here in front. You may even ask Sunday school teachers to come stand with them. Now, you know these men and women. Now, you probably many of you have been here for decades. Come on, Sunday school teachers. I want you to come down here, too. I hope some of you are ladies because some ladies may feel more Comfortable coming to ladies. And I'm going to ask you this question. Do you feel like that I have been speaking from an inspired text? Or do you feel like I've just given you my opinion? Now, if you feel like the Holy Spirit has spoken today, then here's my question to every one of you in the pew. You are not, you are not second-class Christians. You are a crucial part of the machinery called the local church of Jesus Christ. And I hope... That as you prayed for me and I prayed for you, you might feel comfortable coming up to one of these brothers and sisters and saying, I do not know what God wants me to do here, but I am available. Are you available, church? Are you available? Church, are you available? Well, come tell them. <laughs>